Well, good morning. This is, uh, I can't remember the time now, it's almost 9.40, it's well after 9.35, uh, on Thursday morning, the whatever day of June it is, I mean, uh, April it is, 26, whatever. Um, supposed to be pre-calculus trig, Math 113, and right now I'm the only one in the room. I've been waiting and doing things, waiting for someone to show up. So far, no one has. Uh, let's, I'll just go over the things I would have been doing had you been here. Number one, I would have asked if you had done senior course evaluation. I hope all of you have. If not, please do those before the end of the term. If you do want to wait until you see your final grade, you can, but don't forget to do the senior course, uh, course evaluations uh, as soon as you see that because they will be closing it sometime after the term is over and we really value those uh, evaluations. Uh, number two, and I'm wondering if this where everybody is, since I hadn't received from anybody your research papers, uh, are you home doing the final thing on your research paper, if that's the case? Wish you were here, but uh, get those turned in as soon as possible, okay? Uh, number, the next thing was, I certainly was planning to return all your papers to you. I think I've already said that, but you're not here to receive them, so I can't do that for you. Hopefully someone will get here before the end of the period. Um, <clears throat> let's see, what else? Oh, yes. I also need to give you your Chapter 6 test and your final exam, but I was going to do that at the end of the period today to let you know if any of the questions were optional or not just to see if we got them all covered because I had to make out the test before uh, we had a chance to uh, finish the, the, the uh, material. So I'm waiting to uh, I can't do that until you get here too. Now what I may do is pause for a moment and get all those together so that um, when you do get here, I'll be able to give those to you. Well, let me just go over the other issues. So someone may be coming in. Now, yes, we do have students. Okay, good. I thought maybe we had capsule class and no one told me. Okay. Um, so, get my page set up here. Sydney's here, and Sarah's here. Shanika did turn in something last time, and Sarah's here. And we'll check on Cameron, see what he's done. All right. And so I'll be getting this ready for you. I'm going to put this on pause so we don't have a lot of dead time. All right, let me go over since we got some people since I started before. Now, has everyone done the student course evaluations? Not yet, okay? Please get those done before the end of the term. If you want to wait and see what you got on the final or you know, your grade, whatever, that's fine. Just please don't forget, okay? And if there's a possibility you would forget, get it done early, okay? Don't put it off. Okay, number two. And papers are due in. I think both of you turned in your research papers, so that's good. You turned in your old test. I returned your older test to you. Uh, so where are we now? Uh, let's talk about the rest of the term. Um, today, as soon as this class is over, just as normal, have office hours from 1045 until 115. So the day is a normal day. I have a class at 115. It's a second mini term class. Uh, more than likely, we'll go right up until 5.45, which is when that class is supposed to be over. Okay. Okay. Did you, you see it? Okay. Sorry, no one turned anything in. Okay. All right. Uh, so, um, I probably...
probably be going until pretty close to 545 tonight, then I'll leave sometime after 6. Okay? Tomorrow, I'll be on the Birmingham campus. Believe it or not, I should be there. 745 till, I'll be there till afternoon probably, but I'm almost certain they've scheduled a meeting. I know they've scheduled a meeting. I just don't, I'm not certain of the time. I believe it's 10 or 1030-ish. I heard it a couple of different times, so I've got to see what they finally settled on. Um, there may be a second meeting, and if there is, that's going to eat up more of my time. But usually don't schedule, they don't schedule them early, so I'll be there from around 7.45 until hopefully 10 or 10.30 when the first meeting is scheduled, or one of the meetings is scheduled. Now, if they do schedule another one earlier, then I'll be out sooner, but I hope that's not to be the case. Okay, then... Monday. Next week is strange. For y'all, it's probably regular final exam week. Yeah. But for those of us who are in second mini term classes, they are a little different, okay? Because second mini term classes still have their last day of class next week and their final exam next week. So here's how things are going to pan out for that. On Monday, I my first class is a calculus class. They have a take-home final, okay? So I'm not meeting with them. That's a full term class. So I'll be in the office from around 7.45 in the morning until 2 o'clock. At 2 o'clock, I will be giving a final exam in this room, okay? So I'll be in here, and they will be taking it until 3.50. However, I won't be here until 3.50 because I've got a class, many term class on the Birmingham East Campus. I have to be over there before 6, I mean before 4. So therefore, I've got someone to come in and practice the last 45 minutes of their test um, or so. And uh, so I'll be leaving to go over there, and we'll have our last day of class on that campus. Okay? I'll be there until around 6, or so usually after 6. That's Monday. Tuesday, I have a test in here uh, in the morning from 8 till 9.50. So we don't have class on Tuesday because the final exam week. So... Uh, I'll have a, a test that goes from 8 to 9.50 rather than 9.15, and I'll be in this room. So if you need to see me, I'll be here for this. And sometime after 9.50 or 10 o'clock or so, I'll be moving back to my office. I'll be there until about 1.15, which is when I have my other mini-term class, and that's a class. So we have class in here uh, from 1.15, and I know we may actually be doing... Uh, the last of that last chapter. I know we'll be doing the lab on the last chapter. I don't know we'll be doing the test on the last chapter. And because I'm going to be out of town on Thursday, I've got to give them the final exam that day too. Uh, or they, if they elect, they can come in Wednesday. But you see, they've decided that some of us need to go to Tallahassee during final week, which makes no sense at all to me. But they require us to go, so we're going down to look at some new building and and how they run their programs in the building. And supposedly we're going to model things after that, if it makes sense to us, but I'm just assuming it's the way I'm going to do it. Anyway, but they're going to have us go down and see this, okay? So that means I've got to cram a lot into that class. Now, it probably won't take all that long, depending on how much we get done today in that class. I hope we'll finish Chapter 8. If we do, then Tuesday will be easier. Uh, but I don't, I'm not going to require them to take their final that day, but they've got to take it then on Wednesday because I'll be out of town on Thursday and Friday. So uh, then Wednesday, I have nothing scheduled. I'm in, in my office or somewhere around the area from uh, some 45 in the morning until after 6 in the evening. Now, when I say I may be somewhere around the area, if someone comes in to take, do a makeup test, then I'll find them the closest classroom to my office and we'll do the makeup test in that room. That way, if I have to go back and forth to the office, it's not as far to go. I might even be able to hear the phone ring and that kind of stuff. So uh, uh, that's why I don't necessarily come up here to administer the final I use an empty classroom between there and here. If nothing's available, we'll be in here because I'm the only one who can get there. All right, so that's Wednesday. That's my last day on the Bessemer campus until the following Monday. Thursday morning, I'll be on the Birmingham campus because that's where we're leaving from. 
uh, riding the passenger van down to Tallahassee. It's going to be a lot of fun. Maybe we'll sing songs or something. Okay. Uh, so anyway, we'll be uh, leaving. Well, from what I heard, somewhere around tennis or so. So if someone does want to turn in work to me, you can take it to the Birmingham campus before 10 o'clock. Okay. Then we'll be leaving and going to Tallahassee. Then we spend the night there, get up, tour the building and that kind of stuff early the next morning, and then ride back here late Friday night. Okay. So a fun time will be had by all. Uh, so if you have to turn anything to me and you miss me on the Birmingham campus before 10 o'clock, please don't leave it anywhere there. Bring it here to Bessemer, slide it under my door. When I come in Monday morning, that'll be the first stuff I'll try to get ready. Okay? Make sense? And then grades are due, I can't remember if they're noon on Monday or noon on Tuesday. I'm hoping noon on Tuesday. I believe that's right. And uh, so anytime after that, you'll be able to see it. Hopefully you'll see stuff on Blackboard before you'll see it otherwise, because as soon as I get things, all this stuff caught up, I'll be putting things on Blackboard. Just remember that I did mark attendance for my last class. And in the absence of that, it's present. Okay. Um, so uh, I'll put it on Blackboard before you'll be able to see it on Student Suite. Because we have to, I think we have to, there's two things you do on Student Suite. One is record and one is publish or something like that. It's two different things. You can see it only after we do the final thing. Uh, the other stuff we put on early so the registrar's office can process graduates. And neither one of you are graduates, are you? So we'll, we'll be able to, uh, you'll see it on Blackboard probably before you'll see it on Student Suite. Okay. Were there any other things? Okay. Let's, any questions on how to wrap things up? And if no questions, we will get started. Where we left off in Chapter 3. Any questions on trick questions? Not just how to wrap up. Thank you. Trick questions. All right. Now. We were talking last time about component forms of a vector, and this is the thing I was telling you, this is the way to go when you're expressing vectors. Yeah, you can draw them if you want to, but you can never draw them exactly, precisely, you know, and get them exactly right. Writing them in component form is the way to go. It makes everything easier to do. For instance, if you write two vectors in component form, Here's vector u with components u1 and u2. This is a two-dimensional vector. You can have three-dimensional vectors or 15-dimensional vectors. You can't see more than three dimensions, but we can pretend, okay? And then you have another vector v. Notice the vectors they put mold. That's how you tell it's a vector. I can't write mold, so I'll put a little error over those to indicate the vector. Vector v's components, also a two-dimensional vector, v1 and v2. These two vectors are equal. Now, previously we were saying equivalent. Now we're saying equal. If and only if u1 is precisely the same as v1 and u2 is precisely the same as v2. That's what makes two angles, two vectors equal. Their components must be identically the same. In the same order, same sign, same value, same everything. So, for example, in for instance, in example one that we've already done, the vector u from p, that was the initial point 0, 0, to q, 3, 2, that vector written in component form, that's u would be p, q, the initial terminal, okay, p, q would be 3 minus 0 for the x coordinate, first coordinate, 2 minus 0 for the second coordinate, it would be 3, 2. The vector v, which was going from r, 1, 2, to s, 4, 4, is vector v, initial point r, terminal point s, that would be 4 minus 1, comma, 4 minus 2. And when you do that subtraction, 3, 2. Identically the same components, 
therefore they're equal vectors. Okay? Not in the same location, you know, they may not even be within sight of each other, but if they have the same components, they are the same vectors, or equal vectors. Okay? Make sense? So here's example two. Find the component form and the magnitude of vector B that has initial point 4, negative 7, terminal point negative 1, 5. Okay? First we want the component form of V. So since I can't write in bold, I will write this as V with an arrow over it. Okay? What would be the component form of that vector V? Now you can take as many steps as, it, as you need to get there, or you can do it right off the top, whatever you want to do. What's the component form? Give me as many steps as you need. Okay. Let me back off. Okay, say that again. Okay. So, okay, let me, if what I'm hearing is right, you're saying that's the same as vector PQ, right? Is that what you're saying? Okay, where P is initial and Q is terminal. I think that's what I was hearing. So that would be, and what did you say goes here? Negative 1 minus 4, comma, a negative 7. Perfect. And that would be negative 5, comma, 12. Perfect. Okay? That's exactly what you do is final coordinate minus initial coordinate for both of the coordinates. Daniel's here. So sorry about this, but let me go back over everything. Uh, oh, okay, I thought you were limping. Okay. Um, first question, have you done a student course evaluation? No. No. Okay. I checked the voting thing, but I still couldn't find it. Oh, yeah, I didn't have your class in my book. What's that? Really? My only class is my history one class. I've been done that since the last time. And that was second mini term. I don't want first mini term. A first mini term? Yeah, yeah. first. I don't really? Okay, you checked all your emails? I don't have. It doesn't say anything about evaluation. I checked the SGA. And the SGA only was dealing with first mini term. Yeah. Okay. But if you go to that one, Okay, is there a link? Okay, if there was a link, that same link will work for your full term classes and, and, and second mini term classes too. If there was a link, it's the same place. It's Smarty Val is the name of the package. Alright, good deal. Thank you. Final now? I don't you can do everything in five. There weren't any 2.6 questions on the Did you have enough scrap paper? Yes. Okay. okay. Um, all right. Huh? Okay. on the link. Yeah. And you should be able to do all your evaluations from there. You okay? Uh, yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, first announcement was research papers are due today, but all three of you turn them in today. Thanks for being like No, uh, thanks for turning them in. Okay. Uh, number two, before you leave today, let me give you your Test one. That, no, 
Did you turn in test one also? Maybe. I don't think so. I don't think so either. Okay. Those are all due today too. Test one, two, and three are due today. And you fail cheesy, no problem. Okay. Yeah. It would be a problem. Okay, well, all right. But I need those in as soon as you can get them to me. If the research paper was absolutely due today, or you'd lose points to the others, I just need them as soon as you can. Get them to me. Okay? Because I'm going to give you your final exam, or actually two, two, your chapter six test and your final exam today, and those are due next week. So I'll get to that shortly. Don't worry. Much shorter than the first three tests. Much. But it's not more. Okay. All right. So, student course evaluations, research papers, and Okay. Now, Now, I'll give you your, your final exam today. There are two parts to it. Now, I can't remember if I have both of them run off. I may have to go run off one. I was just, things got so crazy yesterday, I didn't get a chance to check on this. So, uh, and they're going to be crazy for the rest of my life. I mean, for the rest of the week. Because all this stuff, this stuff is coming in. Uh, so I'll give these off. Uh, all this stuff is coming in now, and and even though I'm making it through the days much better than I did, was earlier, by the time I get home at night, the fatigue is unbelievable. I mean, I just I usually try to grade some things, and usually if I can get more than two or three graded, two or three papers graded, I'm out. I mean, I just I mean I I cannot do anymore. I'm just that tired. So hopefully over the weekend I'll have some time to get caught up. Tomorrow at the Birmingham campus I hope to have some time to get caught up. Because I'm better in the morning than I am late at night. So anyway, that's my problem, not yours. Okay, so anyway, the uh, I'll give you your papers before you leave today. Okay? Now, when are they due in? Sometime next week. And let me tell you what the parameters on sometime is. Okay, let me start with this. Today's schedule is normal. <laughs> as normal as things ever are. After this class from 1045 until 115, office hours. I'll eat lunch sometime in there, but I'll drop my lunch, I'll eat in the office, I'll be down there. Or somewhere close by. Alright. 115, I've got my a class. And it will probably be a full class today. 115 till around 545. There is a small chance we may finish a little early, but I doubt if it'll be much earlier, okay? I'm trying to finish everything we need for that class today, if possible, and I'll get to that later. Okay, so I'll probably be there until 5.45 today, and I'll probably leave campus sometime after 6. Tomorrow morning, I'm on the Birmingham campus, finally for once, okay? I'll be on the Birmingham, I was there last Friday too, but uh, we'll be there 7.45. I'll be there all morning, but up until 10 o'clock, I hope to be in my office. Sometime around 10 or 10.30, I think we have a book rep coming in, and we've got a uh, meeting that's probably going to take the rest of the morning. So if you do need to see me or turn something in to me, try to get to me before uh, 10 or 10.30. But if you're after that, and the secretary is there, and she knows I haven't left for the day yet, you can turn something in to her, and she'll get it to me before. Okay, so that's tomorrow. Monday. My calculus class has a take-home final, so they'll be doing that and getting it back to me sometime. So there's no, I'm not in a final Monday morning. Uh, first thing I have is 2 o'clock, so I'll be here from 7.45 in the morning until 2 o'clock. So that's a good time to turn stuff in, okay? 2 o'clock, I'll be up here giving the final exam, okay? And that goes... Final goes till 3.50, so I've got to have somebody else come in and monitor it. I've already arranged that because at 
at 3.15, I've got to go to the Birmingham campus to teach my last class in that mini-term course, because we still have classes for mini term So I'll be teaching that from 4 to 6. I'll leave sometime after 6. Okay? So that's Monday. Tuesday, I've got a final in here, 8 o'clock in the morning. So I'll be in here from 8 till 10, 50, uh, 9.50 at least. Maybe if some of them are still working on it, I'll stay as long as I need. But at least till 8 till 9.50. Okay? And then after that, I'm free. This is Tuesday. Free until 1.15. At 1.15, I've got that class again, second mini-term class. The second, second mini-term class. And that one probably won't last that long. We've got our last lab, our last test, and then the final exam. I have to give them the final exam Tuesday because I'm out of state on, or leaving state on, on Tuesday, on Thursday. So I won't have a chance to give them later. But if some of them elect to come in Wednesday, they can do that too because I'll be here all day Wednesday. So I will be in this room at 1.15 and probably go until, I'm guessing we'll be through by three to five, somewhere in there we'll be finished. So if you need to see me or turn something in afterwards, you can do that. So that's Tuesday. Wednesday, completely free day. 7.45 in the morning till after 6 in the evening. I'll be here all day, mostly in my office. I say mostly because if someone does come in to make up a test or something like that, I'll go to the cl classroom closest to my office and administer the test there. Because that way I can go back and forth to my office grading other things and answering the phone if I can hear it ringing, that kind of stuff. But if all the classrooms are occupied between here and there, I'll be up here. So look for me anywhere between the office and here. Okay, so that's Wednesday. That's my last day on the Bassmer campus until the following Monday. Because Thursday morning we go to the Birmingham campus. I'll be there from 7.45 until around 10 or so. Around 10 is when we leave to go to Tallahassee by van. Okay, it's going to be fun. And then I'll be there, you know, be off campus there from 10 or so on Thursday morning until sometime very late Friday evening. So if you got anything to turn in to me and you miss me on the Birmingham campus by 10 o'clock, don't leave it anywhere over there. Bring it to the Bessemer campus, slide it under my door. When I get back here Monday morning, I'll get those things graded and hopefully get your grades in as soon as possible. Okay, does that make sense? Uh, so I try to get everything in by then. Okay, now here's where we left off. We were doing example two on page 417. Um, that was the first part of the problem. Find the component form. Now it says find the magnitude of that vector v. How do we do that? Say again? Okay. The magnitude of V, and this is the symbology for it, is equal to the square root of negative 5 squared, 12 squared, and that would be the square root of 25 plus 144, which is the square root of 169, which is 13. Now, usually a lot of times with square roots we do plus or minus. Do we do that here? Magnitudes are always positive. That's why it sort of looks like an absolute value. They're always a positive value. Never negative. So 13 is your answer. Good deal. Make sense? All right. Let's see how they did it. Okay. Let P equal that. P1, P2. They really know how to stretch out a problem, don't they? Q equal that. But if you need it, do it. Okay, there's nothing wrong with putting all the steps in. Q is uh, negative 1, 5, and that's Q1, Q2. And the component form of V is V1, V2, where V1 is Q1 minus P1, always terminal minus initial, always, okay? The direction matters, the, the value matters, okay? So Q1 minus P1, v, that's minus 1, neg negative 1 minus 4, and that's negative 5. V1 is Q2 minus P2, which was 5 minus a minus 7, just like you said. And that's 12. 
So your component form is a vector v is negative 5, 12. Now notice, notice, when you're talking about points, those are coordinates of a point, they're in parentheses. When you're talking about the vector, they are coordinate, oh wait, I said it wrong, coordinates of a point in parentheses, components of a vector in angle brackets. Okay, that's what I call them, I don't know what they call them, negative 5, 12. Then the second part, the magnitude is simply the square root of the sum of the squares of those components. What is it to die, which is 13. Very good. Any questions? All right. That was example two. Now we're moving to vector operations. All right. There are two basic vector operations that we always will be, or quite often will be doing with, with uh, vectors. One is called scalar multiplication, okay? Now, up until now, you probably just thought of numbers as numbers, okay? But once you introduce the concept of vectors, which have directions associated with the magnitude, then you have to talk about what you were calling numbers before, specify whether they're vector numbers or scalar numbers. If they don't have a direction associated with them, they're called scalar numbers. So this is scalar multiplication, which means you're multiplying a vector by a scalar number, just a pure number. Okay? The vector has directions, the number does not. That's scalar multiplication. Vector addition, and we also include with this vector subtraction, because we know subtraction is the same operation, you just change signs of that. Okay? So vector addition slash subtraction. In operations with vectors, numbers are usually no longer referred to as numbers, but are called scalars meaning they are pure numbers with no direction associated. This text, scalars will always be real numbers. We're not going to have any imaginary scalars. You can in other courses, but not in this course. It's awfully high level courses before you can leave that. Geometrically, the product of a vector and a scalar, K, vector V, notice that bold, I can't write bold, so I'll put an arrow over it. Scalar K, just write the letter K. No symbol label. Okay, is the vector that is exactly the magnitude of K times as long as V. Okay, that's what it does. K scales it up if K is a big number, scales it down if K is a small number. That's why they call it a scalar. It just changes the magnitude. Doesn't change direction at all. When K is positive, KV has the same direction as V had. If K is negative, it reverses direction. It's along the same line, but now the, the terminal point is heading in the opposite direction. Uh, KV, when K is negative, KV has a direction opposite that of V. So, here's vector V. Okay? One half of V, you scaled it down, same direction, but half is that negative. So that's one half. Now it could have been drawn down here or over here or anywhere else, but they just go on the line. 2v is scaled up. In other words, you've doubled the magnitude of v. Same direction, though, but in uh, double the magnitude. Minus v, on the other hand, is exactly changing the direction. The magnitude is still 1, I mean, whatever it was, okay, but the direction is changed. That's what the minus. But if you had a coefficient with the minus sign, like negative 3 halves, that's in the opposite direction, and 1 and a half times as well. Okay? So that basically tries to show all the different activities. A scalar number in front of it tells you how much to expand or contract the magnitude. The sign in front of it tells you whether it goes in the same direction or exactly the opposite direction. No change of direction, no change of the basic line on which it's drawn. Okay? okay. Now, that's scalar multiplication. That goes with that. To add two vectors, U and V, this should, I think, be on this whole slide. If you want to do this geometrically, basically what you would take would, take would say the first vector here, 
And so you have another vector here. First vector here, add that second vector to it, meaning you put the initial point, terminal point. When you're adding another vector to it, put the initial point of the second vector on the terminal point of the first vector, and then let the terminal point go wherever it might lie, and then connect the initial here to the terminal there. Right? That's how you add it geometrically, which is sort of a pain in the neck, like those other body parts. Okay? Uh, so you first position them without changing any length or any direction, so the initial point on the second vector, V, coincides with the terminal point of the first vector, U. Okay? Here is a representation of that. So here is vector U, which is hanging out here. Vector V is hanging out down here. If you were to add these two together, you would start with vector U, and then take the vector V and translate it, don't change its magnitude or direction, translate it so its initial point is at the terminal point of U, and its terminal point is hanging out wherever it would be. Then the sum would be from the initial point of U to the terminal point of V. And there it would be. So you see, first you translate V without changing magnitude or direction till its terminal, initial point V is on the terminal point of U, and then let the terminal point of V hang wherever it is. Then draw the new vector from the initial point of U to the terminal point of V. That is your new vector, U plus V. Now, a couple of things. When you add two vectors, you get a vector. And think back for your scalar multiplication. You multiply a scalar by a vector, you also get a vector. Every one of those is a vector. This is a vector. Okay, so these are all new vectors. We have to give them new names. You don't have to, you could if you wanted to. Second thing to note here, and they're not noting it yet, but I wanted to point it out to you. Uh, we will be noting it later. This is basically the same if you started with V, and then took U and translated U to V, then you would wind up with the same thing. Well, this is the equivalent to what V was. This is what U is, okay? So if you add it that way, you get to the same terminal point. So guess what? Vector addition, U plus V is the same as U plus this community. That's it to subtraction, no. Okay, the vector addition here. Now, this method, if you drew both of U and V here and V and U here, notice what you have made is a parallelogram. So sometimes they'll call this geometric addition of vector the parallelogram method, because that's what you want up with if you draw these. Okay? So, that's vector addition. So this technique is often called the parallelogram law for vector addition called resultant u plus v is often called the vector u plus v is often called the resultant of the vector addition is a diagonal of the par parallelogram. Having adjacent sides of u and v. Okay? So the definitions of vector addition and scalar multiplication. Notice what we haven't done yet is vector subtraction. I said that it is included, but it's not quite the same thing. So we'll get to that in just a second. Um, let u equal u1, u2, that's not the u, is it? Uh, and vector v is v, uh, v1, v2. These are both vectors, and k is a scalar, any real number. It could even be zero. Okay, We don't usually use a zero, but it could be. Uh, positive, negative, fractions, decimals, rational or irrational. There's no imaginary parts. Then the sum of u and v is u plus v, and here's the best way. Geometric or parallelogram method, really a pain in the neck to do. Component form, really easy to do. U1 plus U2 is the first component of the sum. U2 plus V2 is the second component of the sum. 
so much easier to do it with component form rather than geometrically or parallelism. How about scalar multiplication? K times the vector u. Well, it almost is exactly what it looks like. K times vector u would be k times vector u1 common u2, right? And then just like it's almost suggested here, you can distribute the k across, but you have to do it to both components. That's ku1 common ku2. So that's it. A scalar multiple is just multiplying each component by that scalar. Okay. But notice both of these end up as vectors. You multiply by scalar multiplication, you get a vector, and you uh, add two vectors. Very valuable. I thought this was mine. I saw it in there, but I thought maybe someone needed it, so I left it. Thanks. Got a D, sorry. Did it work yet? Okay. Four people at home. I know they've heard that. Okay. Now, before we can do vector subtraction, we need to talk about a new concept, and it's really not that incredibly new. It's called the negative of V. Okay? And I hope it's exactly what you would expect it would be. If you have a vector V, vector because it's bold, vector symbology, wrangle bracket, V1, V2. So that's a vector. The negative of V would then be the negative of this, which is negative 1 times V, which is negative 1 times v1, v2, which distribute that in, just like you did for any other scalar, negative v1, negative v2. You've just negated both components, so now it's going in exactly the opposite direction. So that's the negative of v. Okay? Which I hope is what you were saying. Oh yeah, of course that would be it. Now, now that we know what a negative of a vector is, if you're subtracting two vectors, u minus v, just like with sign numbers, what you're doing is adding the opposite of V. So it would be U plus a negative V. Now that we know what it is, there you have it. Now, that's doing it one way. You do it by components. It's, they don't have U on here anymore. But U1 minus U2, V1, comma, U2 minus V2. It's just exactly subtraction. Okay. But if you're doing it geometrically, be very careful. Okay. It's easy to sort of screw this up. Okay. These are not the same U's and V's as before. But if this is vector U and that's vector V. Now if you are adding these adding these two vectors, you take vector V and put it here, or you would start with vector V and put vector U here. That would be the result. But if you're doing the difference, what you have to do is, just like we see here, add the negative of V. So if this is V, here's U, here's U, okay, and here's V, the negative of V would be here, okay? And if you're adding U plus negative of V, you put the initial point of negative V on the terminal point of U, and then draw down here, here is then the sum u minus u plus the negative v, which is the same as u minus v. Okay? Now, it's also a parallelogram, but it's a different parallelogram, but indeed it looks like it could be a rectangle. I can't guarantee you that every one will turn out that way, but I, in fact, I think probably not, but uh, basically it's another parallelogram not the same one. U plus V would have been up here somewhere. U minus V must be there. But guess what? U plus V is not always formed as a U minus V if it's set up otherwise. U plus V may be quite short and U minus V may be quite long. So don't think that just because this example uh, showed that. Knee hurts. Okay. Component form, that's the way to go. It's so much easier to do it by components than it is by the figures. 
All right. And here is the figures. Geometric. To represent U minus V geometrically, you use the directed line segment with the same initial point. I don't like this method. If it makes sense to you, do it. So the difference U minus V is the vector from the terminal point of V to the terminal point of U when you put the same initials, which is U plus the negative V as shown in that previous figure. So let's go back and see what they're talking about here. Uh, notice here how they drew U and V with the same initial points. Okay, then U minus V is this from terminal point of V to the initial terminal point of U. That's not how I do it. I always think U plus a negative V. It gives you the same effect, and those are exactly the same. But whichever way you like to do it, go for it. Okay, both of those do work. It's just that you have to remember which one to be initial, which terminal. It seems like there's more possibility for you to make a mistake doing it that way rather than doing it. So that's up to you. If you're happy with it, go for it. The component definition of the vector addition and scalar multiplication are illustrated in example three. That's what we're going to do next. In that example, notice that each of the vector operations can be interpreted geometrically fine it can be why bother is what i think so here's example three <clears throat> now and again what they're saying you can do it geometrically if you want to who would want to or so much easier is doing it component wise yes to me, the only way to go. But if you like the geometric, go for it. And actually, sometimes you might actually see what's going on better that way. So here's vector V, negative 2, 5, and vector W, 3, 4. Find each of the following. What would be 2V? If you actually write it out, that would be 2 times V is negative 2, Five. What would that suggest you it is? What vector? Negative four, comma, ten. Very good. Okay. Now if you, oh, V and W. They not have a U in this one. Okay. There's vector W is three four. V is negative two five. What is W minus V? And again, you could draw them out if you wanted to, but man, what a pain. Let's just do it this way. That would be 3, 4 minus negative 2, 5. Component-wise, is the way to go. What would this be? 5, negative 1. Perfect. Component form is so easy to do. Of course, you can't see which way it's heading and that kind of stuff, and geometrically, you get sort of a better mental picture, but this certainly gives it to you exactly. Okay, how about V plus 2W? Well, V is negative 2, 5, plus, can you tell me what 2W is, or do I need to write it out? 6, 8, exactly. And then if you add those two together, what do you get? Say that again. Okay, negative 2 plus 6 is negative 4. Negative 2 plus 6 is negative 4. 4, comma, 13. Yes, yes, yes. Okay? Component form, that's the way to go, folks. It's so straightforward, direct, precise, easy. I mean... What more can I say? Let's see how they do it. Because V is negative 2, 5, and you're doubling that, that would be... Oh boy, you can write out as many steps as you want to. Negative 2 times negative 2, comma, 2 times negative 5. Okay? And that would be negative 4, 10. And there's the sketch. Yay, I'm glad they did it. Okay. Uh, 
it does for you, illustrate it for you. Here is your vector v, which is minus 2 plus 5. Okay? So there would be that vector. Double that, you go up here, minus 4 plus 6. You're just doubling the magnitude without changing the direction. Okay? Difference of W and V, W minus V, component-wise, so simple. 3, 4 minus a negative 2, 5. That would be 3 minus a minus 2, if you want to write it out that much. 4 minus 5. Daniel did it in his head and got 5, negative 1. Perfect. See that? Component point is the way to go. But if you wanted to draw it out, sure, it's fun, so much fun to do so. Uh, now they didn't show the way I like to do it. They showed the way they suggested. Draw a W here. Oh, this, oh no, they did do it the way. I'm going to do it. W plus or minus V. Now you have to get the fact. Yeah, let's Hold it. Yeah. Oh, they, they changed scale on us. That's what happened. I was going to say this doesn't look like the same drawing because it's not the same drawing. They changed the scale of big time on this. Okay? But W was 3, 4, 3, 4, there it is. And V was negative 2, 5. If you have the 4, negative 2, 5 up here. So that would have been that vector there. Okay? So take this one and make it a minus V to reverse the order and make it here. So basically, again, it's just such a pain in the neck to draw. But that's your resultant vector, 5 minus 1. Okay? And notice it's probably shorter than either W or V. Okay? It doesn't have to be. It used to be in subtraction, the big number would have been W. You know, v is, the difference would have been smaller, but not, not here. Okay? So there's... Why they even bother to show that? That just is so much easier. So much easier. Okay, and then the sum of u of v plus 2w, v being 2, 5, and twice 3, 4. That would be 2, 5, plus, oh, take as many steps as you need. 2 times 3, comma, 2 times 4. That would be 2, 5 plus 6, 8 is <laughs> negative 2 plus 6. 5 plus 8, take as many steps as you need, and that would be 413. All right, good deal. Not negative, okay. Uh, and here's the sketch of this. Again, they change scales like crazy. So if they were going to show these, I would show them all on the same scale. Okay. But they didn't. So here's your V up in this direction, negative 2, 5, okay, and then plus 2w. W, remember, was 3, 4. 3, 4. And you double that, but keep the same direction. Oops. And then add this to the other. And you get that. Uh, Alright. Good deal. Any questions? But even, even if you're doing geometrically, I like to do them by components first to make sure I've got the numbers in the right place. So why it's just a added problem to do it geometrically all right let's look at the vector operations we have and uh, we've already hit some of these and i've already mentioned some uh, that we look at but yet but here's what they are vector addition scalar multiplication share many of the properties with ordinary arithmetic just the numbers as opposed to vectors but here's what some are so let u, v, and w all be vectors. Notice how bold they are. Uh, C and D are scalars. Notice that they're not bold at all. Uh, then the following properties are true. And I already pointed this out to you. The sum of u plus v is precisely the same as v plus u. That's what makes the two parts of that parallel and conspiracy have the same diagonal. Now, number two here, that's the uh, commutative property of addition. That works with vectors. Associative property, we haven't shown this, but it's still true. 
If you add u plus v together, okay, get some result there, then add to that w, basically what you're doing is starting with vector v, u, and putting the, the tail of v on the head of u, yo, yo, yo. the initial point here is the terminal point, put the initial point v on the terminal point here, and then add your v to it, and then you turn around and do w on that, you know? Well, that's the same as if you had left this alone, started with initial part of V, added W to it, okay, and then add that sum to the other, you get the same thing. So addition, uh, vector addition is not just commutative, it's also associative. It doesn't matter which two you associate together to add first, when you add them all together, you get the same thing. Now, this introduces that strange little factor, and when I say strange, and little, I mean little, 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 okay? U plus the zero factor. Now that's not the number zero, and the number zero is not written bold. I can't write bold, so if I'm writing the zero vector, I'll put a little vector symbol in there. So U plus the zero vector, because you don't add a scalar to a vector, you only add a vector to vectors, okay? So U plus the zero vector, since the zero vectors components are zero, zero, this is u1, u2. u1 plus zero is u1. u2 plus zero is u2. That's the same as u. You haven't changed a thing. And if you think about it, if you add a vector with no magnitude and such no vector, not much of a vector, to a vector already there, you haven't added anything. It's just nothing. So that makes sense too. And then sort of a corollary to that, u plus a negative u, Basically, chi kind of up to zero. Because if this is u, and the negative u is exactly the same magnitude with just the opposite direction, you start here, go to there, then go back to here, you're at the zero. Okay, so sure enough, that's true too. Just like 7 minus 7 is zero. u plus negative u is zero. Now, these are some sort of weird little made up things, but they're true. The only multiplication we have so far is scalar multiplication, which is multiplying a scalar times a vector. What if you're multiplying two scalars by a vector? So if you're multiplying C times a vector du, you've already started with u, multiply by a vector d, I mean a scalar d, that gives me a new vector du, multiply that by new scalar c, that's the same as just multiplying the two scalars together and then multiplying that by u. It's sort of a form of associative property of scalar multiplication. But it's only scalar multiplication of two scalars and one vector. Okay. Same thing here. This is kind of like a distributive property in that you have two scalars times a vector v, the sum of u. The sum of two scalars times a vector u is c times u plus v times u. It's just distribute the u backwards over both of the scalars and that's what you get. And sure enough, that's true. But what if you had one scalar and two vectors? That still distributes the way we're used to thinking of it. C times U plus C times V. And that makes sense too if you think about it. Uh, U plus V would <coughs> be U1 plus V1, common U2 plus V2. And then multiply this, you get C times U1 plus C times U2. But you distribute that across there, comma, C plus C, E, C, F. And you basically wind up with C, E, C, V. Then, now this up here, this is called the zero, this is called zero vector is a zero identity element. Because you add it, get to anything, you still get the same thing. The multiplicative identity element is just the scalar of one. One times U is U, okay? Just like we've always had it, it works with vectors too. But zero times u is a zero vector. This is scalar number zero multiplied by the vector u. That would be zero u1 plus comma zero u2. Zero times u1 is zero. Zero times u2 is zero. So you wind up with a zero vector. That is a vector. It's bold. All right. Now this is the one that's maybe a little, well, I think it's fairly obvious. 
if you're doing the magnitude of a uh, scalar multiplication vector, C times V. Okay? That's going to be a vector, so you can talk about the magnitude of that. And you can multiply the C times each of the components of V and V like that, to sort of pain in the neck and then have them take the true root of those numbers. Or you can just pull out the V, but not the C, not just the C, the absolute value of C. Because remember, the magnitude is always positive, even if C is negative. And you don't want this negate, negating your here, so you want this absolute value of C times the magnitude of V. And as long as uh, most of the time C is going to be a little more complicated than just V by itself. C, V is a little more complicated. So just do this times that. It's the easier way to do it. Okay. Does that make sense? Those are our rules. Let's now look at well, they skipped our examples. So let's go back and do example four, five, six, okay, seven. Well, I'm trying to find where we are now. Oh, there, no, we're only doing example four. Only doing example four. Okay, I couldn't see unit vectors. There it is. All right, here's what they give us, example four. Vector u is 1, 3. Vector v is negative 2, 5. Okay. The A problem here says, what is the magnitude of 2u? Okay. Now, there's a couple ways you can do this. At least two, maybe more. How would you like to do it? You get to choose. You paid your money, you take make your choice. Okay, so uh, I understand you to be saying there, you're taking the magnitude of this vector. What happens if you multiply, if you double u, what do you get? Is that what you meant? That would be 2, 6. Okay, and if you take the magnitude of that, what would that be? 4 plus... 36 equal square root of 40, which is 40, which if you don't like that because it's a fairly big number, you can factor that as the square root of 4 times the square root of 10, right? What is the square root of 4? 2, 2 root 10. Okay? That's certainly one way you could do it. That last rule that we had, property that we had, how did it say we could do it? it? said you could take the absolute value of 2, which is exactly 2, times the magnitude of u. And what is the magnitude of u? This is 2. Magnitude of u would be the square root of... Say? Uh, did you already give me the answer? Is that... Or it would be magnitude of u would be the square root of 1 squared plus 3 squared, right? Did you already say 10? Oh, okay. I couldn't understand what you were saying. That's 2 times the square root of 10. Perfect. Okay. Yeah, without any work. Which is exactly what we got before. And I think this may be a little simple. Okay. A little bit easier. You keep the number smaller, multiply them. So, that was the A part. Make sense? Let's do the B part. Oh, and check and see what they got in the book. Root 2 root 10. Perfect. The B part is the magnitude of negative 5 U. OK. 
Okay. Which way you want to go on this one? Either way will be fine. Okay, and what would that be? Absolute value of negative 5, which would just be 5 times, and we already figured out what the uh, magnitude of u was. What was that? Say again. Square root of 10. So this would be 5 root 10. Okay. Which is what they got too. Good for them. Okay. Let's do the C one. The C one says the magnitude of 3V. And I, sorry, I sometimes forget to write my arrows over my vectors. Goodness, I'm running out of energy. This is the end of the week, isn't it? Goodness gracious, I'm just... Okay, what do you think this would be? That would be 3. And magnitude of V is the square root of... Okay, I heard... 4 plus 25, which is 3 times the square root of 29. Okay. Shortly and concisely, that's exactly it. Okay? You see that? Don't ever come up with a minus sign underneath that radical. Don't ever come up with a minus sign when you're doing the magnitude outside the thing. You, know, you lose them when you bring them out. Oh, man. So, let's now move to any questions on that. Are we out of time? No, how could it be? Okay. Should we go over? Huh? Should we go over? Just a minute or two. We didn't quite get to go to unit vectors. Sorry. I'm going to go on and end this.